Hi, everybody. Let me start sharing my screen. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, great. So as Christine already said, today we will talk about the satellite imagery. And our agenda will consist of two main parts. Uh, we will start with general principles and uh, challenges of imagery analysis and uh, touch a bit on, on its applications. And in the second part, we will talk about a um, case study, a real world big data solution that was built for satellite imagery processing for an agriculture um, project. Uh, but first, let me say a couple of words about ourselves. Um, as you can see, there are two speakers today, which I guess um, is not a typical situation. But anyway, my name is Olena Klochkova. I'm a Python developer and big data engineer at SoftServe. And also, I have a master's degree in um, geoinformation systems and remote sensing. For those who might not be familiar with the term remote sensing, this is a science of using the imagery taken from satellites or aircrafts and how to process and how to interpret it. And um, on the project that we will be talking as our case study, we were working together with Alexander Berchenko, who is our speaker today as well. Sashko, will you say a couple of words about yourself? Hi. I'm Sashko Bachenko. I'm just a big data architect. So. Okay, thank you. So um, I will start this presentation by saying that currently there are more than 2,000 of satellites orbiting the Earth, and this number is growing each year. Um, they are launched by governments and businesses around the world, and part of those satellites are for communication purposes. Uh, part for navigation and positioning, like for example, GPS satellites, and part for Earth observation. Uh, so this last type of satellites is the one that um, produces uh, the imagery that can then be used in, in many applications. But um, let's talk a bit, what are the benefits of using this satellite imagery at all? Why we want to? Why would we want to do that? So first of all, one shot from above could often cost months of information collection, if that was done on on the ground. So it's a, a lot of time saving, and even more. Sometimes uh, satellite images are just the only way to have a look at what's going on in some remote areas and hardly accessible areas of the Earth, like maybe Amazon forest or your enemy's military base. And if we um, get the imagery of the same area with a certain regularity, we can uh, detect changes and draw some important conclusions about the natural processes and human activities. So uh, to get insights from satellite imagery, we can start simple, just by looking at a color image of our area of interest like these two on the screen right now. So they show the RLC um, in 1990 and 2014. And you can see the, the magnitude of its degradation between, um, between those uh, years. Um, so during 24 years, basically. So, uh, so now the sea that was once the size of island is almost non-existent. And without having these images, it would be difficult for us to see the, the scale of the disaster. Um, but uh, what about this image? So what can we say about it? So these uh, green areas, they look like vegetation. And this white spot in the center looks like clouds. But um, could we possibly miss here anything important? So to get a deeper insight, we should take a look beyond what a human eye can see and analyze other parts of the spectrum, like ultraviolet or infrared or radar. So as you can see in this chart, the visible light 
that the visible means that the human eye can perceive it. So this visible light represents only, only a very narrow range of the whole electromagnetic spectrum. But fortunately, uh, modern technology is able to capture the other parts of spectrum for us. So um, if we look at the same area in the thermal infrared spectrum, we can clearly see a bright spot in the center. And this means this, um, this spot is much hotter than the rest of the area. So with a high certainty here, we can say that this is a wildfire. And the what appear to be clouds on the left image are actually the smoke of it. So this is an example how looking beyond the invisible can, can give you more information. Okay, so, so far we were visually inspecting the images and in different parts of spectrum. And by looking at colors and shapes there, we were able to extract some useful information about the features we were looking at. But um, to get the most, the most value of the satellite imagery, we have to leverage computer power and resort to what is called digital processing. So the most important feature of the digital processing is that here we're able to access individual pixel values in different parts of spectrum called bands. bands. Uh, so, for example, on this, um, on this image, you, you see the nine bands. In the real world, it could be like band one, blue, band two, green, band three, red, band four, for example, near infrared, and so on and so forth. Uh, one of them could be, for example, ultraviolet. So all of these bands will be part of the same image. And now, um, as, as we have the access to individual pixel values in each band, our image is, is not just a pretty picture as it was before, but a data set. And we can apply different mathematical analytical operations um, on it. Some of them more sophisticated, some of them uh, less sophisticated, like for example, computation of indices is, is quite a, a simple uh, operation um, that involves arithmetical operations like adding, subtracting, so quite simple. Principal component analysis is a more com a complex statistical operation and classification is um, like um, usually a ma machine learning task. So um, having applied the operations that we want to apply, the result would be some kind of analytical product that is much easier to, um, to interpret than the original image um, and then the, the original data. So, and all these analytical operations are based on the knowledge of the so-called spectral signatures of different materials. Uh, for example, on this graph at the bottom, you can see three curves. Each one represents represents one pixel um, uh, and its pixel values in different parts of spectrum. Um, in this case, uh, it's a vegetation, soil and water. So looking at the shape of this curve, which is also known as spectral signature, so we are able to say, okay, this pixel lo looks like vegetation. This based on the shape of the curve again, this is water. Um, and this is what, what uh, other analytical operations is based on. So this is like um, having this knowledge, we can tell not only what the features on the ground look like, but also what they are made of. Um, here is one example of a digital processing product, like um, an analytical product. So. On the left, we have an original image of an urban area. Again, seems uh, there is not nothing special that we can see here. But at the right, there is a water index calculated based on the values from the two ba bands. And here, the white zones represent the light zones. They show the high water contact 
uh, content of the area. Um, this is, uh, in fact, the aftermath of the Hurricane Harvey that hit Houston in, um, in 2017, and it caused flooding. And uh, so, as I have said, the water index is calculated based on the data from two bands. So without having access to individual pixels in these bands, it would be difficult for us to see this pattern. As you can see in the original image, it's not even visible. So, um, and also um, now that uh, you apply the digital processing, you could, per, for example, count the number of pixels that we have classified as water and calculate the size of the flooded area. Again, this is something that is um, difficult to do just visually. Um, now, as um, well, the satellite, the using the satellite imagery has become a trend in many areas, and uh, including the agriculture. And um, as our uh, project was done for for agriculture, let's um, speak a bit um, about how the imagery can be used there. So our task is to support farmers in their day-to-day -day activities, like for farmers that they that grow that have some fields and grow some crops there. So we want to support their daily day-to-day uh, -day operations. So what can we do uh, to, to do that? So first of all, we can provide um, regular snapshots of the farmer's fields. So the farmer would not need to walk the, the, uh, his fields uh, through uh, like every day and the fields can be quite large sometimes uh, spanning hectares. Um, so this would be a good um, time saving and cost saving for them to have those images. Um, most importantly, um, based on the raw images, we can um, compute um, a range of analytical products that will um, help to monitor the crop health. Like for example, on the, on the screen, on the right side, you have an analytical product um, called vegetation index. And again, compared to the left side image, which is an original one. So the analytical product uh, shows you a pattern that is not visible on the original image. So here the red zones uh, indicate that there might be something going um, wrong with the crops. Uh, some, the, the health of the crops is poor. Um, so, um, and what is good, uh, about this product about this product that oftentimes they can show you the problem before it gets visible by eye that for example the crops are underwatered so they are suffering uh, or maybe they are overwatered or maybe they are um, affected by insects so this is a, um, a good help for the farmer to detect issues before they even they are even visible um, so based on, and this is just one example of analytical product that can be computed here, then there can be more. Uh, so based on this kind of monitoring, we can generate alerts for the farmer to take, uh, to be able to take immediate action if something is, uh, seems to be going wrong. And also having um, gathered um, a range of historical imagery for the same field, we can build, we can see the variations bit, um, within one field um, and uh, build the soil maps that uh, will help the farmer to, um, to use, uh, for example, more fer fertilizer or less fertilizer in uh, some, uh, in different parts of the field. So again, it, it will be like cost saving uh, for the farmers. So, um, now let's talk a bit what kind of imagery we need uh, to be able to uh, uh, to be able to use for agriculture uh, for agricultural purposes and the key characteristics um, are here on the screen um, the first one is the special resolution 
or simply how big the a pixel is. So here you can say, of course, the, the higher the better. So the smaller the pixel is, the greater uh, level of detail you're going to see. But in a range of mm, dozen of dozen of meters per pixel or less. But again, the the smaller the better. Um, the second characteristic is the spectral resolution. So this term describes how many um, how wide is the spectrum that the image covers? So in our case, it has to be multispectral. This means that it has to have the bands, not only the visual ones, but beyond the visual blue, green, and red. Uh, this is because the most important part of spectrum for um, vegetation analysis is the near infrared. So without having these bands, almost you're not able, uh, this band, this particular near infrared, you're almost unable to perform any vegetation analysis. And the third feature we're going to look into is the temporal resolution, or um, in other words, how frequently you can get an image of the same area. So if you want to, um, support farmers in their day-to-day -day activities, well, it has to be at least weekly, not, not less than weekly coverage. And you can, if, if you can get a better frequency, well, that's perfect. If you are able to get a daily one, that's just perfect. Okay, now let's briefly um, look at um, potential image resources that can be used for agriculture. Um, here is the list of five commonly used satellites. And the first important uh, feature that you can see here is that some of them are public. That means that they provide their imagery free of charge. These are two satellites, uh, Landsat and Sentinel. Um, the three others are paid ones. They are run privately and you have to pay for, for, for their images. Um, so talking about their characteristics, um, you can see that in, in terms of special resolution, the, the paid ones have the best, the best resolution for under two meters. Um, in terms of frequency, the paid ones also tend to have a better uh, one up to a daily uh, for the planet scope. Um, and also, Please note the file size. Uh, the one file can can have a size, one image can have a, a file size of up to uh, one gigabyte um, for Landsat, almost one gigabyte. And if you and if you need to process hundreds or maybe thousands of images daily, this is when you start dealing with big amounts of data. Okay, this slide is just to give you an idea of um, what satellites might look like and how different they can be. So for example, the Landsat is, the, is a huge machine, almost five meters long, whereas the planet scope on the right side is, first of all, it's not a single satellite, it's a 120 uh, of them, uh, the orbiting uh, the Earth at the same time. That's why they, um, on the previous slide, they provided the best frequency, so they are able to um, to give the daily, uh, the daily snapshots of the same area. So the best of all satellites that we have seen here, and also look at the, look at its um, size. It's only thirty by by ten by ten centimeters each satellite and the weight is uh, four kilos. So you could uh, just hold it with one hand, one satellite. Um, this is uh, impressing to me uh, personally. Okay, before we start talking about our solution, uh, there are a couple of slides to talk about 
um, how much effort is needed to perform um, a high quality imagery analysis. So, um, the, well, there are a couple of challenges that we can face here. The first one is the selection of data suitable for analysis. So we have to filter out images that have quality issues due to sensor failure like this one, the, this striped image here. And we have to filter out images that um, have bad atmospheric conditions like too hazy or too cloudy. So you just cannot perform any analysis on them. In other cases, when the clouds do not affect too much of an area, you might choose uh, not to throw away the whole image, but to use it. But in this case, you would have to mask the clouds. Uh, this means you, you'd have to uh, detect the clouds and their shadows as well, and eliminate them as unusable portions of image. So in our example here, um, you can see the clouds are marked green and their shadows are orange. Well, and if you want to automate this task, it's, um, well, it's a complicated task and it, it usually requires machine learning solutions. Also, when you get an image, you cannot just start performing your analysis straight away. First, it has to undergo a number of pre-processing steps. I will just say that without doing them, your um, analysis will not have any sense whatsoever. But sometimes you are lucky that your provider does it for you. Sometimes not. Sometimes you have to do it, uh, it yourself. And one of these um, pre-processing steps is also, it's not the mandatory one, but it is highly uh, recommendable, which is atmospheric correction. Mm, this means that we have to manipulate the pixel values in a way to eliminate the effects introduced by the atmosphere. Like uh, you, you see the example before and after atmospheric correction. So it, is, it means eliminating excessive blue color and haze. And note here that here we are not talking about opening an image in a, sorry. Uh, in a photo editor and um, just, uh, you know, adding more contrast or uh, adding uh, different, different color. No, it's uh, uh, here we have to manipulate the actual pixel values as a result of which the uh, image will become more clear and less blue. And the last, um, and the last uh, challenge that we, we might face that your area of interest might be on the intersection of various images. And in this case, you have to merge them together. This is also known as mosaicing. And sometimes it can be, well, usually it is more complicated than it uh, seems. Uh, finally, uh, let's um, proceed to the solution that we had to build. So what do we have? We have the satellites that make imagery which are then sent to the imagery provider. And also there is a database with the farmer's fields data, and there can be uh, more fields added there regularly as new users are signed up. And um, we have to build a solution that would get the imagery from the provider and fields data from the database and compute a range of um, analytical products for each field that are then are visualized in the farmer's application. And using this application, the farmers will regularly get the information about what's going on on their fields. <laughs> and um, some more details on the requirements to the, the product that we had to build. So we need to um, gather all imagery for more than um, hundreds of hundred thousand fields of the customer clients, um, we have to ingest uh, to, to, to check for new imagery and to ingest it for um, on an hourly basis. Then we have to compute more than ten analytical products for each image. Um, 
we have to provide um, the ability to add new products for existing imagery. For example, the customer may, de may decide to add a new analytical product. And in this case, we may have to reprocess all the imagery we have uh, in storage, all historical imagery or part of it. Um, also, if a new client is signed up, we have to load all the imagery, all the historical imagery that exists so far. Um, we have to allow the on-demand processing for certain imagery. Uh, for, the, for whatever reason, this may happen, for example, due to a bug in our code. Well, this happens. And finally, um, the customer's requirement was to build our solution using open source technologies and to use Microsoft Azure as a hosting platform. And here I pass the word to Alexander Bechenko, who will talk about the technical details of this solution. I should stop sharing, right? Yeah. Hi again. Give me a second to share my screen. Okay. Uh, do you yes. see my screen? Yes. Okay. So let me complement this presentation with an overview of our implementation and obtain its results. Okay, so here's a bird's eye view, or better say satellite eye view of our solution. So first we have third party imagery provider with two APIs. One, to search imagery by some criteria and obtain basic metadata in JSON format. And another, to request actual binary files because they are generated by request from raw sources. That's done by our imagery ingesting service that is responsible for searching, filtering metadata and ordering right imagery. When ordered imagery are ready, the imagery provider uploads them to our Azure Blob Storage using callback. That usually takes from 5 to 20 minutes, depending on the load on the imagery provider site. When the imagery ingesting service detects a new file on Azure Blob Storage, it notifies the raster processor that the new image needs to be processed. After that, the raster processor reads the file, does all the magic, and saves generated analytical products in our spatial temporal access catalog. Binary data in error block storage and vector data separately in Elasticsearch. And here are some numbers. As you see, the imagery ingesting service needs very moderate resources like 10 CPUs and just 50 gigabytes of RAM. But our class, Spark cluster for raster processor is rather huge. It has available capacity of 700 CPUs and six terabytes of RAM. So it's utilized during peak periods and usually auto scaling shrinks it's down to something like 200 CPUs and one and five terabytes of RAM. You may wonder why we need so many CPUs and so much RAM. Please note that we have about 100,000 of farmers fields and have to ingest more than 2000 imagery on a daily basis. Also, a new customer field may additionally trigger up to 100 of historical image to process. And uh, depending on the satellite type, one imagery file may be as large as 250 or even 
950 megabytes. And as Olena mentioned, for each format field, we need to calculate more than 10 different analytical products. And while some calculations like in DVI are more or less trivial, others are either very CPU intensive, for example, cloud masking, or need a huge amount of RAM, for example, principal component analysis. Okay, let's return to our diagram. Uh, as of now, Elasticsearch cluster has 15 data nodes with one terabyte SSD hard drive each. Finally, in Azure Blob Storage, we already have almost two petabytes of data, including both original images and analytical products. Uh, to optimize costs, original imagery files are moved to Azure Blob Cool storage in one month after ingestion. It's a cheaper option for infrequently accessed data. Uh, please note that if needed, original imagery may be re-requested from the imagery provider again, but as I mentioned, that may take from five to 20 minutes for one image. Also, please note that according to the customer requirements, our solution has been deployed to Microsoft Azure, but a similar one could be developed using AWS or Google Cloud Platform. Uh, now let's discuss the imagery ingesting service in more details. So technically it's a set of Python applications, actually more than 15, being run as cron jobs with different frequency from one minute to one hour. Uh, many of them are dedicated to invisible tasks related to monitoring, cleaning, and recovery. All data between them is shared using Azure Table Storage. It's a Microsoft's NoSQL data store to keep any amount of structured data. It's cheap and convenient. Uh, to get the best performance, all requests to the imagery provider APIs need to be carefully profiled. I will provide an example in a moment. Next, uh, the data is not processed all at once. Instead, we process small chunks of data as soon as they are returned by the imagery provider. Here we are talking about uh, JSON results from search API. Uh, Every aspect of the workflow is monitored and has retry logic. For example, if the imagery provider server is overloaded and can't handle our search query properly, we automatically split it to smaller queries and repeat the process until all requests return a valid result, not a timeout error. And here's a simplified workflow. First, we aggregate boundaries of all farmers' fields into large areas of interest and then reasonably simplify them. Something like this. Original fields, uh, red borders, aggregated area of interest, blue border, and a simplified version, green border. Then we uh, defined a required time range for each area. Please note that for some fields, we need only the latest imagery, but for others, we may need all historical ones as well. After that, we send the query to the imagery provider search API and filter obtained results by various rules. For example, a simplified area of interest usually returns a certain number of imagery which don't match any actual field. So here's an example of profiling that I mentioned above. We need to balance complexity of search geometry and the number of redundant imagery in the search results. So if the geometry is too complex, we may receive few or zero redundant imagery 
but the query will run for too long or even fail with timeout error. On the other hand, if the geometry is too simple, a query itself may be really fast, but we will need to receive and handle too much of unneeded items. Okay, after that, we check which ones already exist in our spatial temporal set catalog, then request all missing ones from the imagery provider order API, and wait for them to appear in Azure Blob Storage. Next part is the raster processor. It's a Spark streaming application written in Scala. We use Kafka Direct API provided by Spark and also a Scala library for raster processing called GeoTrails. Also, there is a machine learning model based on Python libraries TensorFlow and Keras embedded into Scala application using JEP. JEP stands for Java Embedded Python and allows to use C Python code inside GVM through Java native interface. We use that for cloud masking. And once again, monitoring for every aspect of the application and retry logic for any action. Here's a simplified workflow. First, we basically build a rectangle around a field and load from the raw image file in Azure Block Storage only that area, usually reasonably small. Something like this. Regional field boundaries, a bounding box, full image in Azure Block Storage, and finally the actual area loaded from that file into memory. Uh, then, inside the application, we clip it to the actual field boundaries, apply an additional radiometric correction, and create a cloud mask. Thankfully, our imagery provider takes all the challenges related to initial geometric corrections. When we are done, we can compute all required analytical products like NDVI or principal component analysis. These computations can be done in parallel. And finally, we save the results in our spatial temporal asset catalog. Okay, spatial temporal asset catalog. In fact, it's not a database name, but a widely used specification that provides a common language uh, to describe various geospatial information. Our data catalog has the following components. First, as already mentioned, all binary raster data is stored in Azure Blob Storage. All vector data is stored in Elasticsearch, as well as links to corresponding Azure Blobs. Also, there is a REST API proxy to serve data from Elasticsearch according to stack specification. It's basically an attribute entry point for all our consumers. Also, I would like to mention several Elasticsearch lessons that we learned. First, use version 6.6 .6 or higher that introduced a new approach to index geo shapes that can dramatically reduce the size of Elasticsearch indices. Create one index for each analytical product and choose a required number of shards for each of them individually, depending on the expected size. Because some analytical products may be much larger than others. Use external versioning of documents. In our case, it's updated timestamp of an original imagery. If that was, was not mentioned yet, the imagery provider may update existing imagery with some corrections, and we need to immediately reprocess all of the related products. And uh, we need the versioning to prevent race conditions when two Spark workers try to insert different versions of the same analytical product. That may happen, then, for example, for a new field, 
we ingested a whole bunch of historical imagery and slowly processed them. And in parallel, we received an updated version of some image from the imagery provider and also sent it for processing. And as a result, now there are two concurrent versions of the same image, and we need to be sure that the most recent one wins. Okay, so what have we received in the end? More than 2,000 imagery ingested on a daily basis. About five terabytes of data processed each day during the season. We are able to cover more than 500 thousands of square kilometers as of now and have a possibility to scale even further if needed. And of course, the happy farmers. That's basically it. Questions are welcome. Uh, hello, this is Serene. Hi. I have a question. Uh, I have a couple of questions. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, so the first question, how many people you are involved with to that project? Um, okay, as far as I remember, we had about 10, maybe slightly more people. So we had uh, two separate teams. One, teams. one team was a Python team uh, working on ingesting service and another smaller one uh, was a Scala team. And working on the raster processor, and also we had uh, several DevOps guy to maintain all the infrastructure. We have uh, automated QC engineers uh, to cover cover everything by automated tests, and we have business analyst, project manager, and and that's all. So about ten people. Okay, and uh, uh, they were mentioned that uh, some uh, providers are paid. And mm -hmm. uh, do you know? Do you know what is the price? Uh, the price is secret, so it's not disclosed. So I don't think you can find the site on uh, on the the price on the site. So our customer has some super contract with the uh, imagery provider and uh, I, I don't know about exact price. So the price also depends on the uh, number of imagery that you uh, request uh, per day. Okay, uh, thank you. Another question uh, for that for, for areas that you showed in your presentations, how exactly you detect the area of the field? Uh, I mean that small small part uh, with. Uh, uh, Let yeah. me find it. Do you? Yeah, yeah, this one, this one. How you exactly find? Uh, oh, yeah, oh, maybe the previous slide. Um, where is the whole picture with this one? With this. Okay. Small, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this one. How do you detect okay. the small parts? Uh, so basically we start with small parts. So the first step is to read from uh, PostGIS uh, all the individual field boundary. So, it, it's, so each red border is one field. So here we displayed only four, but in fact it's 100,000. It, it's the first step. Uh, so we have uh, 100,000 of multi polygons. And in practice, um, many fields are grouped uh, together, so they are neighbors, and uh, they may even be even owned by the same customer. So one customer may have a thousand of 
neighbor fields. So we, uh, so inside Python application, we combine those individual polygons into a, a larger one. So in, so we started with one hundred thousands of multi polygons because some of them, so most of them are polygons. So it's uh, just one polygons, but uh, some fields have more complicated uh, form, like the field contains several parts, maybe split by river or something like that. Uh, that's why I mentioned multiple polygons. And when we combine neighbor fields, we get maybe 10,000 of them. And at, at that point, we could uh, send uh, these multi-polygons multi uh, to our imagery provider, but it will be too slow because that geometry is still super complicated. So, so here we combine, so we simply uh, reasonably simplified. And uh, to describe that uh, green borders, uh, we, for example, need only 10 points, but uh, original uh, border may need 20 fields. Uh, but in fact, uh, 1,000 of fields, uh, of points. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm and then they, the, 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 then they sent that simplified green geometry of the simplified border to uh, imagery provider and in return us all the imagery uh, that intersected that green border. And for example, do you see my mouse? Yes. Yeah, so for example, we may receive imagery here that uh, intersects our simplified border, but doesn't intersect any actual field. And we will need to filter this imagery out inside the application. Mm -hmm. mm, I'm asking because I'm thinking how it could be possible to detect uh, the forest fields, not just as uh, plantations, yeah, but really forest fields. There is no some um, pattern. So uh, I'm looking the I don't know some provider. So mm. uh, well, so. In, in our particular case, we uh, had a slightly different uh, need. So we uh, didn't need to uh, detect whether it's a field or is a forest. So we already had in our database the borders of each farmer field. But in different cases that uh, Olena mentioned, we might need that. Yes, yeah, so we might need to detect uh, forests, uh, fields, uh, some floods, flooding, uh, fire, and so on. And uh, uh, looking at uh, multiple spectrum, we can uh, detect it. Lena? Um, I, uh, were you asking about differentiating the forest from a crop field? Do you mean that task? Uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, yeah. the main task. That's just identify uh, the forest on the map and uh, like different shapes as well. Uh, okay, this is uh, like a classic, uh, you know, remote sensing task, which we were not uh, solving in our application, but yes, it is uh, what, usually, what is usually happening when you get an image and you want to, uh, you know, extract some information. So uh, there could be several approaches to it. If, for example, you care about forests and uh, everything else, so you don't care if the others are water or asphalt or anything else. There might be some specific index that you apply and you, for example, have a threshold and you say, um, yeah, if this index is above this, this is a forest. If it is below, it is not a forest. Another approach could be, yes, from, like from here is to apply like the classification. 
Um, so this is uh, supervised or unsupervised classification, a more complex task. And in this case, you will have the full classification of everything you have on the on the image. So, uh, for example, forest, um, fields, water, whatever concrete. So there could be several approaches to it and there is no right answer without uh, knowing the details. But uh, yes, it is a classic, classic um, task of interpreting an image. I don't know if okay. it's, uh, if answers yeah, your the, question. Yes, yes, you answer it uh, and I'm happy with it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay, and maybe last question. Sorry, there are a lot of questions for me. Um, how can we detect static objects and dynamic objects uh, on the map? Um, is it some difference because we are actually taking some uh, snapshot of by some time and uh, for example if some car stands on some place and it's moved to another place and was it possible to detect it uh, or just how, we, how can we do it? Well, it depends on the on the task that you are solving. For example, um, first question to you, do you have enough special resolution to detect a car? If your pixel size is like uh, 10 meters or 20 meters, so it is unlikely. You can see there is something there, but, but you cannot say what it is. Um, and well, if you if you have a pixel size uh, that's uh, able to detect a car, uh, for example, in my um, in my slide where I was talking about five satellites, uh, there was the best um, yeah the best um, s s spatial resolution is two meters here, but here we were talking about only those products that are um, that are usable for agriculture. Uh, for example, they have the. Um, they have. About it, sometimes you're not getting the support that you need, both even from your own community and, and, and other people. Like how do you stay motivated through the tough times? I think I'm really interested to know. Uh, how am I hearing? We, uh, <laughs> what the mechanisms are for dealing with that? I think let's stop. Thank you. Sorry, do they? <laughs> What's that? And I, I think that was not. No, it's not question. me. No, it's not. It's not. Okay, but not a question to ask, right? Okay, so I was talking yeah. about the the pixel size. Under two meters here is the best you can see on the screen, but this is only about the products that are that can be used for agriculture. This means yeah. that, Lena, for example, yeah. Sorry for interruption. I will also like to mention that, uh, for example, we also have Google Maps, and and they have much better special resolution, uh, sometimes like 15 centimeters. Or yeah, so, so I was they going... they have another... Yeah. Ah, okay. I was going to talk about that. That's, uh, the two meters pixel is not the best possible. You can see, for example, Digital Globe, they provide 50 centimeters. Uh, yeah, 50 centimeters as far as I know, 40 pixel size but this uh, mm, this image is uh, black and white so sometimes if you were uh, if you want to detect a car maybe this is a good choice for you um, so but not um, not with the images not with the um, images that we used here for example five meters three meters you will see that there is this is not a vegetation there and you can say that maybe it's something that i don't know um, metal or something but you could not say probably that this is a car with this kind of resolution but it is possible to detect cars too with the right uh, characteristics of the image yeah and if for example you have uh, a new imagery each day you can compare compare them and detect that something disappeared. Yeah, at least uh, sounds like military application more than the civil. <laughs> and uh, returning to Google Maps, so they have a great special resolution, but they have extremely low temporal resolutions, once per year in the best case. So it's not suitable if you want to 
uh, see updates on a daily basis. That's and why it's, it's never used in agriculture. And it's only vi visible bands, so not suitable for agriculture. Yeah. Well, I believe Google uh, provides you at least near infrared, but, this but is a not for free. Set this is a separate service that they have, not the usual Google Maps that we are used to use. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But that's still not made on a daily basis. Okay. Is that a service called Google Earth? Uh, no, there is another one which I don't remember. It's actually, they have tools for developers. They have some code up there that you could take and apply to your uh, images and you can download some images but I don't remember what's the name of the service uh, um, I can I can search it and let you know if you're interested but, but it's, it's not, not free. it's not it's not the uh, Google Earth okay okay thank you that's all questions for, from my side <laughs> thank yeah. you very much thank you for the questions anything else Well, uh, maybe uh, <clears throat> not a, a simple and not a, a usual question. Uh, uh, do you have any information why Azure uh, was chosen for this application, not AWS or uh, Google Cloud? Uh, well, I have a very simple answer uh, because our customer already had a partnership with Azure and they had all the infrastructure in Azure already. Mm, thank you, thank you. Well, in practice, it's a very rare case when you start developing application and somebody let you choose the cloud platform because it's chosen not for your application it's chosen for the whole corporation and there may be some non non-pure technical reasons for that choice thank you